My name is Ruth Holton. I am Deputy Director of something called the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs. Now, you may have heard the word quantum technology or quantum computing before, but you know, may not know much about it. But I can tell you that quantum technologies can measure things far more precisely than you'll ever be able to do with conventional technology. We can provide absolutely secure communications guaranteed by the laws of physics. And finally, I'll tell you today about why quantum technologies can process information in a much more powerful way. OK. But before I go on, I'd like you to all cast your minds back to the year 2000. Hopefully, everybody here was at least born before the year 2000. <laughs> I think they have been. Um, and think what you were doing then. Well, something momentous happened in the year 2000, apart from the start of the millennium. I started my PhD. OK, here I am in a physics lab a long time ago, 17 years ago. And what I was doing was cooling down small pieces of semiconductor and looking at fundamental particle interactions in them. OK, and I was told by my supervisor at the time that this was to create something called a quantum computer. OK, now I looked at what this quantum computer was supposed to be and I looked at my experiments in the lab and compared them and I said, we're not going to see a quantum computer in my lifetime. OK. I've changed my mind now. I really think that this quantum computer I will see in my lifetime, and we are already ready to see quantum technologies. Really, we're at the start of a truly 21st century um, technology here. But what is this quantum technology anyway? Well, I don't have time to give you a full hour quantum physics lecture. You'll be glad to know. But what we're doing with quantum technology is starting right from the beginning and using new fundamental properties of quantum particles. And there are two very important ones. So the first one is the idea that a particle could take two different paths at the same time. And we know that because that single particle can actually show wave interference. Okay? That's known as quantum superposition. That's already a bit weird, but there's a second more um, weird effect, and that's known as quantum entanglement. And this is where you take two particles, they're identical, and you make them interact, and then you separate them. And they may be separated by uh, thousands of kilometers. Okay? But if I change something with this particle, this particle knows about it instantaneously, okay? even faster than the speed of light. Okay? So this is a very, very strange phenomenon. You might think it's a very esoteric, esoteric physics, fundamental physics thing, but I can tell you it's also very useful. Why is that? Well, a lot of these talks today have been talking about networks in a variety of ways. I'm going to show you that actually we're creating something called a quantum network, and it's unique and very, very different. Okay? This network might be on a silicon chip that's only a few millimeters wide, or it might span across thousands of kilometers as a communication network, but the principle is um, the same. Okay? What we have are photons traveling between those. And those photons can take several paths at once. That's the um, superposition part. We then have nodes, which contain single particles. They might be atoms, or they might be electrons or ions. Okay? And the photons causing these two nodes to be entangled with each other. And what that means, of course, is that if I change one of the nodes, that's going to change other nodes throughout the network instantaneously. Well, why is that useful? Well, it's because, actually, if you set up the network in a particular way, you can process information in a uniquely parallel way. The photons are traveling down several routes at once, so it gets to try out several different combinations all at the same time. And there are particular um, calculations you can do with this which are much faster than anything we'll ever be able to do with a classical computer. Okay. Now, I'm going to look next to see how, how far we've come here. Now, I would say that a universal quantum computer that can do everything is still maybe 20 years off. Okay? But there are things that we can do probably within the next five years or so. And the example I'm going to give is of protein folding that we can work out with quantum simulations. Now, a quantum simulator is a very specific network or, or computer set up to do exactly one task. Okay? Now, protein folding is an important problem in chemistry. It's 
calculating how a complex molecule with each of the individual atoms is vibrating and all those vibrations connect to each other. Okay? If I add another atom to this chain, the problem grows exponentially faster, so it's very difficult for a classical computer to solve that problem. But it's an important problem because if you change the temperature or the pH of this thing, suddenly it'll shrink up into a little ball and completely change configuration. Okay? The reason why quantum computer, computers are better at this is because you can set up a network that looks very, very much like that molecule, and it can simulate it by trying out all the different combinations simultaneously and find a ground state for that molecule. So the calculation can be far quicker. We can actually solve these problems like protein folding and other quantum chemistry problems. Why is this relevant? Well, this might help us design new drugs. Or we might look at um, problems, for example, in industrial chemistry. Catalysts, for example, is a very similar problem. So you can see that quantum technology has quite wide implications where you might not expect. Okay, but how far are we along, really, in building one of these quantum simulators or a quantum computer? Right, well, let's go forward to 2008. What happened in 2008? Well, you might remember in the autumn that there was the uh, credit crunch, but at exactly the same time, a good thing happened. So I arrived at the University of Bristol as a lecturer, okay? So that's a, a good thing. Um, so I like 2008. Um, what I was doing, I was funded on an EPSRC fellowship to turn this, this is an entire lab full of bulk optics, um, very large and not doing very much, to basically this, which is a small piece of semiconductor with an optical fiber attached to it. And the idea is that single photons come one by one out of that fiber, and we can input those into a quantum network. Okay, why else is 2008 a great year? Well, it was the first time a, an integrated quantum photonic chip was demonstrated. And actually, that was also demonstrated at the University of Bristol. This is why I wanted to come to Bristol. Okay. What this is, is the equivalent of those, that bulk optics that I showed you before, but on a, a piece of um, glass. We input photons into waveguides here, and this represents one logic gate. Okay? So this shows that you could take a huge amount of bulk optics and shrink it down to a, a tiny size. Okay. But this is basically a development which is, let's say, almost a, a classical technology, and we're putting the quantum particles into it. Okay? So you'll probably hear a lot of us quantum photonics people say, well, making the quantum computer is just an engineering problem now. Okay? I, would agree that, I would agree that that's uh, uh, mainly true, but I would actually say, what an engineering problem this is. We have huge challenges ahead of us, but very interesting challenges and absolutely unique. So where are we now? Well, we can already take silicon chip technology that we use using a stand standard foundry and put hundreds of these gates onto an even smaller chip. Okay? You can go next door at a stand and actually see how big these chips really are. But there's still a long way to go because we need to put a huge amount of electronics around these chips to make them work. And really, that's a lot of um, what we would call classical um, electronics technology that we still need. So what we need are things like very fast but almost lossless optical switching, far less lossy than anything we have at the moment. We need high-speed radio frequency and microwave electronics. We need to take actually a systems integration approach because to put thousands of these onto a chip is much more challenging and requires much more reliability, something we're not used to working with. And we also need to do things like put all this at, at just a few degrees above zero, okay? We've got very far in that, actually. You can actually make a cryogenic system that runs on the power of a domestic fridge. And we might even want to put these into satellites, okay? So you see there's a lot of technology that we still need and we, that we still need to develop. Okay, and that's where all of you come in. So, how can you help us? Well, you can come and visit our stand next door. You can come and contact, contact us at Ket Labs. We are always looking for good engineers, entrepreneurs. We're looking for people with a better industrial approach to come and work with our physicists and engineers in the lab. Okay? What's really important is that we've just 
found out we've been funded for the Quantum Technologies Innovation Center, which is specifically designed to do that. We're bringing together all this expertise, and our aim, I would say, is essentially to make the quantum equivalent of Silicon Valley here in the Southwest, okay? That might seem like a, a tall goal, but let me tell you, the states do not have the technology that we have. We have all the expertise and all the know-how right here, and we're looking for um, investment and engineering expertise to add to that. So there's a really fantastic opportunity. So please come and join us. <laughs>